Amen. All right, keep your place there in 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to be there throughout the sermon in that area of the Bible talking about this story of King Saul. So what are we talking about this morning? So we're in our um, emotional series, and what have we been talking about? We've been talking about different emotions that we go through in our lives and how to handle these emotions. We talked about anger in the first sermon. We talked about how uh, you know, there is a time to be angry. You know, a lot of times, you know, the Bible says that there's a righteous anger. Jesus himself got angry, but we're not to be, you know, quick to anger. The key with anger is having that righteous anger for the right reasons and also not being quick to get angry. Then we talked about fear. We talked about anxiety last week. We talked about how there is a time to be fearful and what we should be fearful of. And it's pretty simple with fear. We're only supposed to fear the Lord. That's it. So we're not supposed to fear men. We're not supposed to fear what's going on in this world. We're to fear the Lord. That's it. It's pretty simple. All right. So there's a time for some of the emotions that we're talking about um, the last couple of weeks. But the emotion that we're going to talk about this morning, there's not really a time that you can say that, you know, this is a good thing. Okay. So we're going to talk about depression this morning. We're going to talk about depression. Depression I mean, I was actually pretty surprised when I started looking up numbers on things, especially now, you know, depression in the country has gotten way worse than it was in previous years. I mean, imagine that, right? Most of you probably are thinking that that's not a surprise. But depression is a huge problem today amongst Americans. It's about, you know, between the age of 12 and 30, there's about 12, one in 12 people suffer with major depression. And what major depression is, look, I'm, first of all, let me just give a disclaimer. I'm not a doctor. I just play one on YouTube, okay? So um, I'm not a doctor, but here's the thing. Depression, major depression, like we're going to talk about this morning, is defined as a, you know, someone that goes through a two-week period where they are just so down that it affects their actions. It affects how they can you know, live their normal, everyday life. So... 80% of these people that go through this depression of this 1 in 12 people have difficulties performing everyday tasks because of the depression. Okay, so it's not just the point I'm trying to get is this depression, this thing that, you know, we're going to talk about this morning. It's not just a feeling. It's not just, you know, you're down. It actually affects the way people are, you know, living their lives and prosecuting their everyday lives. And I can guarantee you that with coronavirus, because these, you know, with the, the whole thing that's been going on this year, that, you know, with the numbers that you've seen from like substance abuse and all these types of things, that you will find that this one in 12 has gone, is skyrocketed. I guarantee it. Okay. So look, it's a big deal today. That's what I'm trying to say. And I want to give you this morning, I want to give you some troubleshooting tips from the Bible on how you can handle depression in your life. You know, you say troubleshoot. I'm going to give you a methodology this morning on handling depression. You say, what do you mean by troubleshooting? I mean, we're going to, we're going to isolate problems and we're going to eliminate possibilities is what we're going to do this morning. When we're look, that's what troubleshooting is. You're isolating things, you're eliminating possibilities, and you're looking for what? You're looking for the root cause of a problem. You're not looking for all the effects of the problem. You're looking for what's actually causing the problem. So we're gonna, I'm going to give you some, uh, some, some tips, a methodology this morning on how you could narrow down, if you're depressed or suffering from depression, how you could narrow down you know, the root cause of your depression. I mean, wouldn't you want to know what was causing the actual problem if you had a problem like depression? So what we're going to do is we're going to first study this story about King Saul. We're going to first study this story and see what we can learn from this story. Turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 10, and let's kind of begin with King Saul. Let's look at when King Saul was chosen as king. So of course you remember the book of the Judges in the Bible You know, is about how God sent judges to free the Israelites, to judge the Israelites, to lead the Israelites you know, out of captivity, you know, to get them right. And then the people, they just saw too many of the heathen nations around them. Everybody's got a king. It's like, we want a king too. So they wanted a king and God gave them a king. God chose a king for them, and this king was King Saul, the very first king of Israel. So Saul is anointed king. Look down at 1 Samuel chapter 10. Saul is anointed king, and then he's told to go and meet with these prophets. 
And the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 10, in verse number 5, and the Bible says, After that thou shalt come to the hill of God, this is Samuel, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city. He's giving Saul direction here. And thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with psaltery and a tabret and a pipe, musical instruments, and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and, that, and shalt be turned into another man. And then look down at verse number 9. So Saul's been anointed king, and then he's being told by Samuel to go and do this thing, and then it comes to pass in verse number 9. And the Bible says, and it was so, these things happened, that when he turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and those signs came to pass that day. And when they, so now he's been given another heart. Kind of sounds like he was born again here. Right? So this is where Saul, King Saul, he's been anointed. He goes, he gets saved. Look, salvation is the same throughout the entire Bible. It's not some mystical thing. It's always been the same. Okay? Saul gets changed. God gives him another heart. And those things that came to pass that day, and when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. Turn to Acts chapter 19. So what's this all about? Where the Spirit of God, he's, he's gotten saved. Now the Spirit of God has come upon him. Look at Acts chapter 19 and verse number 6. Acts chapter 19 and verse number 6. So we're going to look at a New Testament equivalent of what has happened to Saul where the Spirit of God came upon him. And if you look at Acts chapter 19 and verse number 6, the Bible says, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So this is also like, you know, the day of Pentecost, where, you know, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and they spoke in all these different languages, and were able to preach the gospel. So the Spirit, you know, the Holy Ghost coming upon them in Acts chapter 19, and many other parts of the books of Acts, is the same thing that happened to Saul, when King Saul, when the Spirit of God came upon him. And it's interesting because the same thing happened, right? The Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied. Right? That's why, you know, you can be, you know, we're all sealed by the Holy Ghost, right? When you get saved, you are sealed. You know, Ephesians 1 says you are sealed by the Holy Ghost. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit is what seals your salvation. But, you know, when you are doing the right things and you are, you know, just living for the Lord, you know, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. And then, you know, that many times, like Stephen was filled with the Holy Ghost, and, you know, he says great things. You know, you say great things for God. You're filled and you prophesy, right? You, you prophesy, right? You know, I, I, I pray that I'm filled with the Holy Ghost when I'm preaching. I'm, I pray that the Holy Ghost would, would fill me and that I would be able to say the right things and not say the wrong things. You know, and I pray that that happens before every sermon. You know, I, I would pray that I, the Holy Ghost would, you know, fill me so I could say, I could prophesy great things. So this is the New Testament equivalent. I want you to see what the Spirit of God coming upon Saul, and then he prophesies what that's all about. All right? Now turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 15. So, of course, now Saul's become, he's, he's saved, he's the king, here we go, he's the first king of Israel. You know, it doesn't take long for King Saul to get filled with pride, and he gets rejected from being king. Okay, he gets fired from the job. So he doesn't obey, he was supposed to go um, destroy the Amicalites, and he doesn't do it. He also, you know, one time he doesn't wait for, for Samuel, and he sacrifices himself. He's just doing these things that are just disobeying God, and then when Samuel calls him out on not following what God told him to do with the Amicalites, he does not admit fault. Look at 1 Samuel 15 and verse number 26. And the Bible says, And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. So this is after you know, Samuel points out, you know, he's like, why did you not destroy all the, the animals? And why did you not destroy everything? He kept the king. He, he didn't kill everything like he was supposed to. It, you know, like God told him to utterly destroy everything. And he didn't. And then he gets called out on it and he blames the people. He said the people wanted to do all this. He doesn't take responsibility. And then in verse 26, Saul basically tells him that the Lord has rejected you from being king. 
Okay, so look, look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, the chapter that we read. So now we've been brought up to the chapter that we just read, and, you know, David has just been anointed king. So God, you know, replaces Saul. Saul is still the king, but he's been replaced by God. As far as God is concerned, Saul is done, and David is now the king. So now we have a little bit of a, a political conflict of interest. I mean, that, that, talk about an awkward situation. You know, hi, you know, God's chosen me to be king, and you've been rejected, but you're still the physical king. So this is an issue, right? So, so God is, is basically, he's removing his favor from King Saul, and he's, he's moving David into the position. Look at 1 Samuel 16 and verse number 14. God wants Saul out at this point. Because why? Because he's been rejected from being king. All right, so he's chosen David, and he's trying to, or he's, he's, he wants King Saul out of the position. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So this is, you know, uh, an interesting statement right here. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now this used to confuse me right here when I first started, you know, reading the Bible and studying the Bible. I mean, an evil spirit from God? What is that all about? All right, turn to Judges chapter 9. Let's look at this idea of this evil spirit from God. So we see that the spirit of the Lord, Paul or Saul, is no longer filled with the spirit of God at this point. It's been removed from him. He didn't lose his salvation. He's just no longer filled with the Holy Ghost. God has removed his spirit from him in that sense, and then he's replaced it with an evil spirit from the Lord. Now remember, first of all, when the Bible says an evil, you know, God was going to do evil, or God repented from the evil that he was going to do to Nineveh. When that word evil is used in in that sense, it's talking about hurt. It's talking about um, trouble. It's talking about judgment. Okay, so it's talking about, you know, God, you know, wanting to judge a situation. He was going to do judgment to Nineveh. He was going to do judgment to Saul here. All right, turn to Judges chapter 9. Look at verse number 23. We see here, you know, um, Abimelech. You know, we've studied Abimelech. We see Abimelech he did an evil thing. He killed um, all of Gideon's sons. And then the, the Bible says in verse 23, Then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Seshem, and the men of Seshem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. So here, this is another evil spirit from God. Okay? Look at, go turn to 1 Kings chapter 22. Let's look at another, um, another example of an evil spirit from God, or a bad spirit from God. So in 1 Kings chapter 22, we see the story of Ahab and Jehoshaphat. Ahab is trying to convince Jehoshaphat to go to war with him. Ahab, of course, is a wicked king, and Jehoshaphat is a good king of the, you know, the lower kingdom of Judah, and he's trying to get you know, Jehoshaphat to join forces with him and go to war. And this is when Micaiah, you know, Jehoshaphat, you know, says, hey, don't you have a, all these prophets came and said to Ahab, you know, you're going to do great and you're going to win the battle and you, they're just lying to his face, right? They're, they're the yes man. And Jehoshaphat sees right through it. He says, do you have a real prophet here? Is there a real prophet around here? Maybe we should ask a real prophet. And Micaiah finally says, you know, you're going to die if you go. And then, they, you know, they throw him in jail and whatever, right? So, but the point is, Look at 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse number 21. The point is that God wanted Ahab to go to battle. God wanted Ahab to go to this battle and die. Okay? And look at verse number, uh, 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse number 21. Well, look at verse number 20, where the Bible says, And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And that one said in this manner, and another one said in that manner. So God wants him to go. He's like, I want someone to persuade Ahab. You know, God wanted to wipe out Ahab. He wanted to remove Ahab. And, the, and then there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? So the Lord said unto him, you know, how? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also, go forth and do so. So all these prophets that told Ahab that he was going to, you know, win the battle. And you remember, you know, the prophet that made the horns of iron. He's like, you're going to be like these horns of iron, you know, and you're going to just win the battle and all this. They were influenced by this lying spirit from where? From the Lord. 
okay? Because the Lord wanted to pronounce judgment on Ahab. Now look, Je Jehoshaphat, when, when God's judging somebody, you don't want to be standing next to him. Right. So that's why Jehoshaphat, you know, was rebuked later on, you know, for, you know, should, should thou help those that hate the Lord? The prophet said to Jehoshaphat. So look, if you, this is just another sermon in itself. If you got somebody who's a wicked person and doing all these things, first of all, you're not supposed to fellowship. We're supposed to be separated from all that. But look, the thing is, God's judgment is coming down on somebody. You don't want to be standing next to him. I mean, Jehoshaphat, he almost died. You know, there was a saying, right? Close only counts and horseshoes and hand grenades. You don't want to be standing next to somebody who's being judged by God when the hand grenade goes off, okay? When the tactical strike comes down on that person from the Lord. You don't want to be standing there. Jehoshaphat almost died. All right, turn back to 1 Samuel 16. So we see that this is, I mean, this is a method that God uses to judge people by sending, so basically this evil spirit from the Lord is one of God's angels that goes to perform judgment on somebody for the Lord. Okay? It's not, a, it's not a demon. It's not something like that. It's someone doing a task that the Lord wants done in that case. Okay, look at 1 Samuel 16 and verse number 23. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand, so Saul was refreshed, and it was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So, I mean, David was a musician, and this is just another really interesting point, and one of the guys actually preached about this on Friday night, but Saul was troubled. God removed his favor. He removed his filling spirit from Saul. This is what happened. Saul rebelled against the Lord. God rejected him from being king. He removed his spirit from him. It didn't mean he wasn't saved anymore. He's under the chastisement of God now. And God sends a troubling, an evil troubling spirit on him. And it just makes him this, I mean, you see if you read the story of King Saul, it makes him this just depressed, this, this angry person all the time. I mean, he's trying to kill people. He's, he threw a javelin at David. He tried to kill his own son. I mean, he just became, you know, this troubled individual. And, but it's interesting because he was troubled by this spirit. And what helped him? What helped him? Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And this isn't what the sermon is about, but it's also helpful, okay? Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18. This will just show you, this, this verse in 1 Samuel 16, 23, it shows us the importance of the right type of music. Amen. Of the right type of music. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18. And the Bible says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So we can be, look, we can be filled with the Spirit. It's over and over and over again in the Bible. Right? And it says if you're drunk with wine, if you're in sin, you're not going to be filled with the Spirit. Saul was not filled with the Spirit anymore. Okay, so you're, if you're saved, you have that earnest, that down payment of the Holy Spirit that seals you. But you can also be filled with the Spirit. Okay, but then the Bible says in verse 19, speaking to yourselves, that means speaking amongst ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your what? In your heart to the Lord. So this, I mean, music goes to your heart, the Bible says. And while in 1 Samuel 16, 23, it talks about how that music that David played, it, it calmed Saul. It made him, it made that troubling spirit, that evil spirit, depart from him. It, it made his heart better. Those spiritual songs, those psalms, those hymns that David played, it made, you know, but look, it works the opposite way too. It works the opposite way too. I mean, there's a reason that all these violent, you know, you know, kids that go and like murder a bunch of people are listening to like all this death metal satanic music. I mean, there's a reason for it because it affects your mood. It affects your heart. It affects the way that you think. It affects the way that you feel. Just the way David's music affected Saul in a good way. Music of the world that's out there can and can and will affect you in a bad way. And it, I mean, it can depress you. It can depress you. So, go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We see that Saul is, he's troubled. He's depressed at this point. 
So he hires, you know, David to, he has David play this music for him to, so he can feel better. Okay? So what, but what were the causes of this evil spirit? What were the causes of Saul's problem? Because look, the, the music is just a, it's, it's just a fix for that. But it's not the cause, I mean, it's not fixing the cause of the problem. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel, I'm going to turn there myself. First Samuel chapter 16. So let's look at the root cause here because the Bible says that, I think I've got the wrong verse listed here. I think I'm in 15. Yes, go back to 15. There you go. I had a mistake and I caught it during the sermon. I'm getting better at this. <laughs> Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number 23. This is after, you know, Samuel is, is currently rebuking Saul. He's currently rebuking for not destroying the Amicalites. And he's telling them, he's telling them, look, it's, it's a big deal. He's saying, you know, it's not that you just, you know, just missed a command from the Lord by him, you not admitting that you, you literally, I mean, because he said, you know, you didn't listen to what God said. And he said, instead, you know, you basically said you still, you did what God said and you didn't. And then in verse number 23, he says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. He said, you have rebelled against the Lord. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So look, he said, because you, know, you haven't admitted your fault, you haven't admitted that you haven't followed God, he's like, you're in rebellion right now. So you think about that. You think about that you know, with your parents' kids, when you're not going to admit fault and you're not going to follow what your parents say. You don't want to be in rebellion. Rebellion, I mean, you say, oh, it's just I just didn't listen to my parents that one time. No, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You see why we're a family integrated church now? Because kids need to hear this too. So even the smallest thing, if you're not admitting, I mean, what did Saul do? He, he left a few cattle. You could say, oh, it, that's not the point. The point is he didn't listen, and he didn't admit that he didn't listen. He was in literal rebellion to the Lord. You don't want to be in that place because it's as the sin of witchcraft. As the sin of witchcraft. Very serious. So, first of all, he rebelled against the statutes of the Lord. He rebelled against God. So that's the first reason. The first reason. The second reason is this. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. So we see rebellion. Just sin is the first reason. The second reason is this. Vanity. Vanity was the second reason. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 18. Look, he was envious of David from the beginning. He was insecure in his own position. He wanted all the attention for himself. Look at verse number 6 of 1 Samuel chapter 18. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out all of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Uh-oh. And Saul, and then look at the next verse. Do you think, now Saul was like, you know what, I'm glad I've got a good general. I'm glad I've got a guy that can, just, that can just do what he's supposed to do, and he's overachieving. No, Saul was very wroth, the Bible says. He did not like that David was doing better than him, and that people were seeing that, and the saying displeased him, and he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands. And to me, they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? He's insecure. He's, he's focused only on himself. Saul. He's focused only on retaining power. He's focused only on retaining his reputation, his image, his vanity. He's focused on vanity. So we see the main problems with Saul. And the reason that you, you'll see throughout the rest of the story in 1 Samuel with him and David, it's all because of his rebellion against the Lord and his vanity. Those two reasons. Okay, so you say, what does that have to do with us? Well, let's, let's do some depression troubleshooting this morning. Okay, let's look at depression troubleshooting. Let's apply these two things to us today and see if it matches. All right, so the first one is what? Sin. Just sin in general. 
I mean, let's just talk about, you know, the unsaved, the, the world. Let's talk about a sinful lifestyle. What will that lead you to in this world? And this is the most ironic thing ever because nobody except probably people in this room seems have this figured out. Okay, most people out there think, oh, you know, the Christian life, you know, most people probably talk to me and they realize that, you know, I'm not going to go out with them after work and I'm not going to do all the stupid things that they do and all these kind of things. And they probably think I'm boring. But I'm telling you, I don't have a boring life at all. I'm telling you, if you are living the Christian life and you think it's boring, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. I mean, this is not a boring life and it should be filled with joy. But you know what? You know what they're misunderstanding? They're misunderstanding because this world out here for the unsaved, for everybody, what they're after, they're after this immediate gratification. They're after this, you know, this life of, of the drunk. Is they're looking for this immediate instant gratification. This, you know, this quick, you know, but look, this is this is normal today. I mean, this is normal. I mean, just think about just drinking. I mean, alcohol itself. It's, people do it because it's fun. Do you know that it actually depresses you? <laughs> you know, they do it because it's, they, they're looking for this short-term, short-term high. But do you know that it actually, I mean, even science and the medical profession will tell you that alcohol is a depressant. It depresses you. It brings you down. Let me just read you a quote. When broken down scientifically, alcohol is in fact a depressant. The more alcohol you drink, the more it depresses the functions of your body. I mean, it will actually slow your heart rate and all these different things it says. It says many people feel a little extra pep when they first drink alcohol. However, this effect is short-lived. It does not take long for the depressant effects to begin to take over. Do you know that if you drink a lot, you will become depressed? Alcohol is a depressant. You know, the side, one of the side effects of being in what they call an alcoholic is depression, suicide. People drink to become happy, but it actually brings them depression. It's crazy. The world tells you, here's another one, the world tells you that fornication is normal. The world tells you that, you know, fornication is normal. And if you're not doing it, you know, I mean, what, you know, everyone's doing it. Everyone's just living with their girlfriends. Nobody gets married anymore. I mean, it's a generational problem at this point. It's a generational problem. Everybody's just out doing it, and you're like, oh, no, you know, I'd like to wait till I get married. People are like, what? what? You crazy? But do you know that fornication will depress you? Do you know that, that fornication leads to disease? Leads to, like, unwanted pregnancies? It leads to, like, murder? I mean... That sounds fun. Look, this isn't fun. This is short-term high stuff. Everybody's chasing a short-term high. And, and they're ultimately just going to lead themselves. I mean, they're leading. I mean, these young girls and women today are being sold the biggest lie called feminism. Hey, you don't have to get married. You don't have to get married and have children. That's just the, the man trying to keep you down. You need to go out and just live in fornication and just live with all these different people and just, you know, basically become a whore. But you know what that will lead women today to? Depression. Depression. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And you wonder. I mean, look, I was involved, like my mom has been involved in like the pro-life cause since I was, I can't even remember since. And I remember there's so many statistics on women that, you know, they, they get abortions and it just leads them into severe depression later in life. Because guess what? They may have done something wicked and evil when they didn't know what it was. You know, someone was lying to them. Oh, this isn't a child. This isn't, you know, a human being. And they go and they make some decision when they're 16 years old, 17 years old, 18 years old. And then, you know what? They grow up and they get married. Maybe they, maybe, they got, maybe they get saved, hopefully. And then they have children and they're like, oh, what have I done? And they realize they've murdered their own child 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I mean, that's why, like, pro-life, you know, people that are against abortion, I mean, they're for women. They're for women not ruining their lives. 
They're for women. I mean, this is all a lie. It's all a wicked, evil lie. I mean, that, that's fornication, though. Oh, but it's fun. I mean, forget the marriage stuff. How it'll ruin your relationship with your, with your future husband or your future wife, and it could even cause you to not even be able to get married to certain people. I mean, forget all that. It'll just wreck you. It'll ruin you. 1 Corinthians 16, 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but not this one. It's different. The Bible says that this sin is different. Because it says all these sins that you do are without the body. You go out and you steal, and you, you know, whatever else. It's all without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. It's like, look, you're destroying yourself. I mean, it should be pretty easy to convince people not to go into fornication. Because all you have to do is convince somebody, hey, could you not destroy yourself, please? The Bible says you shouldn't destroy yourself. Don't destroy yourself. I mean, it just leads into all these terrible things. And look, if you get into all these things, and it leads you into all these serious, serious sins, as fornication is one of them, look, you're going to be depressed. That's why people are depressed. That's why many people are depressed. They're chasing the short-term high that the, that the world tells them is what they should chase, and they end up destroying long-term things that can't be undone, and they're depressed. Look, it's it just, it, it, this, this life, is this world is just one pursuit of sinful pleasure after another, and it will all lead you to pain and suffering. All. I mean, today, the world, the world, by the way, they'll explain this away. The feminists will explain this away. They'll say, oh, no, it's all these, it's all the restrictions that, that the Bible and God has put on people and this guilt on them that, that's causing the depression. Really? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is a disease made up in your mind? No, that's real physical, that's real physical consequences. Is, is ending an unborn child's life, is that, is that made up in my mind? These people are morons. And they're wicked as hell and they're liars. And they're destroying women, is what they're doing. They're destroying women. It's a nice counterpunch from Satan, but it's not even really a good one. Right, that, oh, it's, it's the religious restrictions that are just depressing people. It's like, well, you're an idiot. All these consequences are real. They're physical. They're medical. They're, they're real. They're real. So what's the next one? And by the way, all these things that we talked about, as far as the unsaved, they apply to the saved too. If you get into all these things, get into all these sins, because, I mean, is it possible for a saved person to become a drunk? Is it possible for a saved person to fall into sin, to fall out of church, to just backslide in the Christian life? Is that possible? Happens all the time. It happens all the time. I mean, the worst thing is watching it happen to people. That's the worst. Because you're just watching this happen. And you're like, hey, this is happening. Hey, you know, and you just watch it get worse and worse and worse. It's, it applies to saved people as well. It's even worse with saved people because you're going to be under the chastisement of God. God's going to make sure you get away with nothing in this life if you're saved. So what's the second thing? We saw that Saul was in sin. What's the second thing that caused his depression, caused him to be down, caused him to be troubled? The second thing is vanity. The second thing is vanity. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. You want to learn about vanity? Read Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes was written by the wisest man who ever lived, aside from Jesus. Amen. He was given everything by God. He was given all this knowledge by God. He was given all this wealth by God. He was given everything. And he wasted it all. He wasted it all. But he didn't really waste it all because he gave us the book of Ecclesiastes. So we can read it so we don't do the same thing. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1. What is vanity? Let's talk about vanity. I mean, the Bible, I mean, even the front of your bulletin says vainglory. What does that mean? Let's talk about that. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse number 3. The Bible says the words of the preacher. This is King Solomon. King Solomon is the preacher here. The son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Sounds like this guy's in a good mood. 
What profit have a man of all his labor which he had taken under the sun? He's like, he's like, he's an old man at this point. He's saying, he's like, what was the point of all of this? I mean, imagine. Does anyone want to be where he's at right now? This guy is depressed. He's saying it's all vanity. But what does that mean? Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Just one chapter down. He's saying here, he's saying by vanity, he's saying, everything that I have done has been out of personal pursuit or pleasure. That's what he's saying. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse number 9. Now, you've heard of keeping up with the Joneses, right? I mean, everybody, you know, you see it all the time around here. Everybody's got to have the nicest car. Everybody's got to have that. You want to find out who the most broke people are? Look at the people driving the newest cars. That's a general rule. It works. Right? I mean, people just strapped with so much debt, but that's not the point of the sermon. Anyway, here, here's the bottom line. King Solomon won the race. You can't win the keeping up with the Joneses. What that will do is that will just make it to where you're not happy with anything that you have ever. If you move into a nice house and you're constantly looking at the nicer house, and then you move into the nicer house, you're constantly looking at the guy that has the nicer house than you, there's always somebody with a nicer house. It'll just make it so you never appreciate anything that you've been given. You'll never appreciate any of your blessings. But Solomon won. He won this. He won this competition. He's the only person I've ever heard of that actually won the, the competition. Look at verse 9. He says, So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. All my wisdom remained with me. He's like, I was the smartest and I had more than everybody. Ever. <laughs> He's like, I, I, no one could keep up with me is what he says. Look at verse 10. He says, Whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, from my heart, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hand had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. He's like, hey, look down at verse number 17. He's like, hey, I had it all. He's like, anything I asked for, I got it right there. I wanted something right now. I mean, he had hundreds of wives. Anything that he wanted, it was just his right now. He withheld nothing from himself. And in verse 17, I hated life. He says, therefore, I hated life. You're like, what? All I need is a million bucks and I'll be happy. No, you won't. He's, he had everything. And, and therefore, I hated life. Because why? Because why? Because the work that was wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. This is why. This is why he hated life, even though he had everything, because he did it all for himself. Because all was vanity. Just like Saul, he was obsessed with himself. Maybe, we, we, look, you're depressed? Do a selfishness check. I mean, why are you constantly thinking about yourself? You're depressed? You don't think there's people in worse situations than you? Yeah. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, or just look at the front of your bulletin. Here's what you need to do. If you're depressed and you're like, you know what, I, 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 here's your problem. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 3, or look at the front of your bulletin. The Bible says, let nothing be done through strife or what? Vainglory. That means just constantly just trying to glorify yourself. That's what that means. It says, you know, but in loneliness, oh, so, you know, here's another one of those great opposites Bible verses, right? Where it says, hey, don't do it this way. Instead, do it this way. Just in case you misunderstand, right? He's going to give you both sides of the coin here. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Hey, why don't you start thinking about other people? Amen. Hey, why don't you get your, your mind off yourself so much and just start thinking about other people? Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, this whole thing isn't just about you. You know what the opposite of vanity is? Selflessness. 
The opposite of caring about nothing but yourself is selfishness. Here, you know, here's, here's another thing. There's all kinds of studies out there. Let's look at some, what's well, science. Let's look at science today, because they figured this out last year. Helping others can relieve anxiety and depression, 2017. I mean, somebody spent their whole career studying and doing all these different studies, and they found out that helping others can relieve depression. And, and I mean, in this article, in this big, it's an abstract. Okay, an abstract is, means this person has done a huge study and a white paper, and the abstract is the summary. Here's the summary. Here's what you should do if you want to not be depressed. Be supportive of others. Amen. Have compassion for others. Make a positive difference in someone's life. Make constructive, constructive comments to others. Avoid do anything, doing anything that would be harmful to others. Avoid being self-centered. Brilliant! I mean, it's brilliant. I wish someone would have thought of that sooner. I mean, that was 2017. There's people who've been depressed for thousands of years. An article from time.com. Look, I could read you articles on this. I just had to stop because there's so much scientific evidence out there. Here's a, um, an article from time.com. Time Magazine. Think about it. The secret to happiness is helping others. It's amazing. Here's a quote from the article. Giving back is as good for you as it is for those you are helping. Because giving gives you purpose. When you have a purpose-driven life, you're a happier person. Goldie Hawn. It's brilliant. I mean, Goldie Hawn figured it out in 2018. Many people, look, first of all, I'm so irritated with people repackaging the Bible and selling it as their own. You know, I'm, people make an entire career out of repackaging ideas that aren't their own and just, you know, passing them off. But I, I'm not even going to go off on that one. All right. Study after study shows that the Bible is true on this, is what I'm trying to get across to you. Becoming less self-focused and helping others literally brings joy to your life. You know, try it. Try it. I, look, I have done this on several different occasions. Something has gone wrong, whether it be at work, whether it be things just aren't going the way I want them to go, and I'm going to be like, you know what, I'm going to go help so-and-so dig up a sewer pipe. And every single time it happens, it, it helps. It works. And look, here's the thing. If you're depressed and you do this, I mean, this is a troubleshooting technique, okay? If, let's, let's try a fix, right? I mean, that's what you do. If you've got a car that's broken and you want to, you know, it's one of four things. All right, let's start with the least expensive thing and start fixing those four things and we'll see what happens, right? If you're depressed and you go out and you help somebody with something, you're like, you know, Brother Frank needs help building a fence or he's struggling with this thing. I'm going to go over there and I'm going to be labor for him. And I'm going to help him or I'm going to just be a blessing to somebody in some way and it helps your depression. You found the problem. You found the problem. You're too self-focused. You're too self-focused. Look, I'm not saying don't pay attention to issues that you need to worry about in your life, but I'm saying if you're literally depressed and helping other people helps bring, and it will, it will, trust me, that, that's part of your problem, is you're too self-centered. You're too focused on yourself. So, I mean, use these two criteria for troubleshooting depression in your life. You know, look, I'm not downplaying, you know, hormonal problems or changes people go through in their life or, or whatever, you know, or actual medical struggles. But here, let me just tell you something. From my limited medical experience, okay, when somebody I knew that was going through depression, whether they were, you know, treating it with medication or not, there was always a root cause. And the problem, look, the problem with the medical industry today is they're, they're not even interested in the root cause. They're just like, take this pill. I mean, people, I mean, don't get me started on like antidepressants and all this. People are just going and they're just thinking that just pills are going to fix their life. And, and you people, they're crazy. Crazy. I mean, these antidepressants that you read about, you know what the side of, one of the side effects is? Suicide. Depression. It's an antidepressant. And its side effect is depression and suicide. It's like, hey, this will make you feel better unless you kill yourself. I mean, look, if the problem is this. I mean, if you have a car that needs fixing, you've got to find the problem. I mean, if you've got a car that's leaking oil, you, I mean, 
You can just keep buying oil and buying oil and buying oil, but the leak's going to get worse and worse and worse, and pretty soon you're going to destroy the motor. You've got to find the problem. You've got to find the problem. And the Bible says that mainly, you know, do a sin check on your life. Am I into stuff that I shouldn't be into? And if you're saved, you know, I mean, that could be actual judgment from God on your life. Like, don't go around being like, hey, brother, I think you're depressed because, you know, don't be Job's friends. This is for you personally to do a check on yourself if you're suffering with depression. And then second of all, you know, are you just living a life of vanity? Because people that are really selfish, they, they, are, they get depressed a lot because they're just living a life of vanity. So do this. Do this. And then go help somebody with something if that's you. Start thinking about other people. Start thinking about others. You, you, I mean, haven't you ever felt good buying someone a gift? I mean, when you actually help something with something serious, it's like that times 100. That's why soul winning is so great. Amen. That's why soul winning is so great. Look, soul winners, you're going to get to a point where maybe there's going to be a day, especially if it's 150 degrees outside, where you're like, you know what, this isn't that much fun right now. But you know what? Those are the days where something great happens, and you go home and you're just like, you know what, that was awesome. Amen. You know what, I'm glad I got out of bed and went soul winning today. Amen. I mean, those are the days where, you know, if you just stop focusing on yourself and start thinking about other people, you know, and, uh, you know, from Christmas gifts to their very soul, you know, it's going to help you not be depressed. So, I mean, just look at this. Look at this. Listen to the wisdom of Solomon. Don't be Solomon. That's the beauty of the Bible, is, is we can look at somebody else's mistakes, and we don't have to fall in all those pits. Let, let's, let's listen to this wisdom that the Bible gives us. And do these checks on your life. And, and I bet you, you know what? I bet you get some joy back in your life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.